The committee includes what Strauss calls a broad cross-section of Alabamians, yeah, representing several general. ethnic and yeah. economic groups. Oh, Among the members still, are I several know. legislators and former governors. Well, you, House Speaker Joe McCorkadale and Lieutenant Governor George McMillan support Carter. Neither man has actively campaigned for a presidential say, candidate before. Mr. Carter is facing criticism from his opponents for his decision to stay in Washington until the crises in Iran and Afghanistan are over. Strauss says the president's foreign policy has suffered unjust criticism. Do we have all the answers? No. But they're being dealt with with maturity and with wisdom and with judgment and with a man who is showing that you don't have to shout and raise your voice or you don't have to have uh, uh, Mayaguez types incidents where people are killed to show uh, that America has will on the subject of the American hostages in Iran, Strauss says only that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. What? Lisa Nielsen, WSFA you TV about the News. Or the general of the campaign. Oh, I don't know the prime. The House Judiciary Committee created a subcommittee to study a bill which would limit non-resident alien ownership of agricultural land. The bill, sponsored by Representative Bob McKee of Montgomery, would limit such ownership to 160 acres. The full committee was reluctant to adopt the constitutional amendment for fear of being in violation of the federal constitution. The House Ways and Means Committee reported favorably on several bills, including one which would allow local school boards to transfer between line items in their budgets, but only up to 20% of the total budget. The committee also gave a favorable report to a bill increasing hospital license fees by about 100%. Many committees of the Senate were very busy, and because there were so many meetings at the same time, some committees had to meet briefly so that still others could meet. The Senate Education Committee was one. The members discussed a bill which would change the regulations on teachers' annual leave. Because of the time problem, no decision was made. The Senate Governmental Affairs Committee was busy reporting out 13 bills, including two bills which would change the makeup of the Board of Control for the State Employees' Retirement System. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News at the Capitol. Basketball spirit on the Alabama State campus has probably never been higher. The Hornets have a 23-1 record, are ranked number one in the state, but have little time to savor that ranking. Because the word upset has been mentioned with increasing regularity on the Auburn-Montgomery campus. We're just going to have to uh, hopefully get in a position where we can some way dictate tempo of the game. If we can do that, I think we've got an excellent opportunity. There's no doubt about it. AEM is playing the best basketball right now. They've played all season. They're fighting for a chance to get into the playoffs, and we're fighting to protect a number one rate and try to finish the regular season number one. Because you know, those players at Alabama State, even though they're good players, are just people. And the game will be decided between the white lines of this court, not in the sports pages or in the polls. And so we're expecting a tremendous challenge from AEM, and we expect a much closer ball game over there than we had here. It has tremendous importance because it gives us somewhat of a, of a uh, indication, or you can use it as a yardstick, of measuring our basketball program. Fred Albers, WSFA TV Sports. Of players that we have. Kind of like Coach John Wooden said, he had rather have. In his order, Judge Varner ruled that St. Clair County Commission Chairman James McClendon and two other commissioners were trying to block the state's attempt to build a prison when they moved to condemn that same prison site for a park. Judge Varner told the commissioners to dismiss or stay the condemnation proceedings pending in federal court in Birmingham. Broner's motion also prevents the commissioners or anyone else in that county from interfering with the construction plans of the prison. Broner's motion will become permanent February 29th unless attorneys file motions to argue further. The ruling says it was compelled by public interest. Varner says inadequate facilities have already led to the release of inmates across the state. And he says the time could come when the state could face the release of dangerous inmates unless people face the reality that more prisons are needed. Werner says there are people in every county who could oppose a jail, but he says his concern is the protection of the jurisdiction of this court in this case, namely to allow Governor James to build a prison. In a release this afternoon, the James administration says it was pleased with the ruling and would go ahead with its plans to build a prison in St. Clair County. The release also hinted of other possible prisons for the state, an indication that the administration is confident Judge Varner's order will stop any future protests against prison expansion plans. 
Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. In order to look like this, women are willing to sit in a beauty chair for hours. It took five hairdressers five hours to get this one done. Others say it's taken one hairdresser as many as 20 hours to complete the process. It all depends on the style, the number of ornaments, and of course the number of hairdressers working on it. Ever since Bo Derek wore braids in the movie 10, women have been flocking to their hairdressers and asking for the Bo Derek look but one local hairdresser says it's not the Bo Derek look. Bo compliments the idea and it make, uh, it aroused the awareness of the Caucasian as far as braiding, but uh, I can't say she popularized braiding because braiding is an uh, African art form of hairdress for the, the women and sometimes the men. Uh, Derek is a celebrated person, and so is Cicely Tyson. Cicely, at one of the award shows, she did wear the braids, and they were very attractive on her. And I have to say, perhaps Cicely borrowed the idea of the ornaments worn in the hair from our African sisters. And I like the idea very much, but um, Derek compliments the braids by making the Caucasian aware, arouse their awareness of how attractive the art is. Once you get your hair braided, the style can stay in place up to nine months, but Ms. Pratt recommends the hair be taken down every four months. It can be braided again later. Many hairdressers along with Ms. Pratt say the style hasn't reached its full potential and say they expect it to really catch on in the summer months. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. Nationally known hairdresser James Finney says the weight of the beads can cause hair to slip out of the scalp. Finney, who has worked with braids for the past 10 years, says straight hair is more likely to do this than curly hair. However, there are some hairdressers who disagree. They say it all depends on the size and weight of the beads. Ceramic ones are the heaviest, while acrylics are the lightest. These hairdressers say the light acrylic beads should be safe for all types of hair. Another problem is that of extensions. These are artificial pieces of hair used to add extra length. Finney says adding these to your hair can be dangerous. He says an unqualified hairdresser could rip out your hair. Even if you don't have extensions, it's best to have a hairdresser take your braids down. Small metal wires and rubber bands should be cut off rather than pulled. Hairdressers say pulling them off could split the ends. So if you're willing to take the time and have your hair braided, it's better to also take the time to properly care for it. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. Sonny Smith continued his youth movement this evening, starting three freshmen, a sophomore, and a junior. For the most part, the Kitty Corps played well. The Tigers used his own defense almost exclusively, and except for an early lapse in the game's opening moments, it was effective, forcing the outside shot. LSU hit only one-third of its field goals in the first half, but some costly Auburn turnovers still allowed LSU to hold the halftime lead 28-25. The second half was a battle of strategies. LSU wanted Auburn to move into a man-to-man -man defense. Sonny Smith wanted to stay in his zone. What ensued was a standoff. 
LSU held the ball for four solid minutes without taking a shot. That strategy appeared to backfire when the Tigers turned the ball over, but Frank Poindexter missed an eight-foot jump shot. LSU once again controlled the ball, Auburn fouled, and Ethan Martin was ready. He rifled home six straight free throws in the final 42 seconds, and LSU left town with a 50-44 victory over Auburn. Fred Albers, WSFA TV Sports. Well, I think anybody, now, anyone that looks for that particular label just is in, if there's a, I don't know if there's a left field, if there's a field further than left field, they're in left field. They don't know what they're talking about. I think sometimes, Phil, that some people in the media must find something to be cynical about or to be critical about somebody. And that's, if there's one label that just doesn't touch us at all, that's totally preposterous, is that one. I made the statement eight years ago when I came into this league that no one on my team would ever win the Southeastern Conference Scoring Championship, and they won't. And the thing that's kept us together, and when you're talking about individuals, you're talking about the defending SEC champions, you're talking about the team that won the most games last year in the SEC. Uh, it's just preposterous. That's one thing that we are not. Now, we're not perfect, just like you and I are not perfect. There's no halo ringing around your head or mine, but that's, that's ludicrous. You turn the thing around, uh, against Auburn. You were in trouble before you played Auburn down in Baton Rouge. What have you done differently since then to, to reel off these nine wins? Trouble is kind. You're kind to say trouble. We were in we were in all kinds of trouble. We were two and three, ninth in the league. I think several things, Phil. I think that, you know, we lost two games on last second shots by one point. But I think we went back. I went back and regrouped myself. It was the lowest part of my whole coaching career, and I'm very seldom down. Very optimistic. I I don't see uh, cloudy skies. I can usually see the blue through through big big black black clouds, so to speak. But we regrouped, we reanalyzed, rededicated, and just reunited. And uh, there's a song called Reunited. I should use that. Uh, <laughs> and just have played very well the last month, extremely well. In the Auburn game down there, you boarded them to death. You can't <clears throat> expect to do that well on the board. I would be surprised. I would really be surprised if, if we did. Uh, Auburn's a, a good basketball team, and I know people say, well, he's just being kind to Sonny Smith, but 23 points separates them from seven more victories. Now, you take away seven and add seven on the other column, and you've got a good basketball team. You may think it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, particularly at today's prices. But if you're in the market for a new house, don't try to take the project on alone. Enlist the aid of a professional broker of several of them. They'll be happy to help you and at no cost whatsoever to you. You may want to place an ad under the real estate wanted column of the local newspaper and look for ads of homes for sale by owner. If you end up buying from the owner, be sure to have a lawyer or knowledgeable person check out the transaction. Don't keep a secret of the fact you're looking for a house. Today, with over a million brokers in America, you're apt to find many eager brokers, one of whom may have just the right house for you. It's up to you to get as many people helping you as you can. Surveys have proved that often an informed, experienced broker can get your house at actually less money than the inexperienced buyer can get for himself. As you know, all things being equal, the price of the house should equal its fair market value. But keep in mind, in house hunting, that all things are seldom equal. Every buyer should be protected by a professional appraisal of a house if he intends to buy. This doesn't mean a seat-of-the-pants guess, but a careful, thorough scientific appraisal made by the Veterans Administration or the Federal Housing Administration or a qualified independent fee appraiser. Now you can always proceed to negotiate the sale at a higher price than the VA or FHA appraisal if you wish. Also bear in mind that most sellers start a thousand or two or even higher than the price they're finally willing to accept. 
And on top of this is superimposed the broker's percentage. Finally, don't offer what you're willing to pay. Always start with an offer of less. This will compensate for the high start by the seller and broker and possibly allow you to level off at your price. This is Coping, and I'm Ivy Berman. I got Reese and I've been out 400 in the now that I've reached the now 400. Here's Reese and I've been out 400. Reese and I've been out 400 in the now that I've reached the I've been out 400. The cattlemen bid on handcrafted items to benefit their wives' group. Then it was down to a different sort of business. Former Agriculture Secretary Earl Butts told the cattlemen they are the type of people who made America great. This food system we have in America is one of the strongest components of the total American enterprise tonight. And yet we get kicked in the shins because beef is too high priced. You hear that, don't you? But said food and fuel are the commodities Americans are most concerned about, and he said too many people are condemning food producers for making a profit. But he pointed out that Americans eat better than any other nation and at less expense. Butts also criticized the growth and attitude of government. He said the private sector is under siege and members of private industry must become active in politics in order to improve their lot. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. Alabama cooperative extension economist Dan Linton believes a summer Olympics boycott could produce a surplus of meat here in the United States. He says thousands of tons of ground beef, turkey, broilers, and pork are being prepared for shipment to the Soviet Union. The food would be used by caterers at the Olympics. If the U.S. decides to skip the summer games in Moscow, the food may not become part of the boycott. However, there is the strong possibility that longshoremen may refuse to load it as an export commodity. Linton says the excess meat flooding the market for a short period of time could produce lower prices at the checkout counter. However, that situation won't be received enthusiastically by livestock producers. Linton says a meat surplus could lower prices in the short run or keep them steady over the long run. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. Mayor Emory Farmer told the group that while the crime rate is rising in other cities, it dropped in Montgomery. He says this happened because of a team effort in crime prevention, including local residents, law enforcement officials, and other governmental departments. Farmer praised the police department for their accomplishments, saying the average person takes a police officer for granted until he or some member of his family needs police protection. After the mayor's speech, club member Earl Manning read a brief biographical sketch of each nominee. Investigators Wayne Butler, Billy Smith, and Officer Michael Ward. Each was presented a certificate recognizing his outstanding police work. Then the Outstanding Police Officer of the Year was announced. He's Officer Michael Ward, who's been on the police force since 1977. During his 20 months of street duty, Ward arrested or assisted in the arrest of 16 burglars. In accepting the award, he thanked the group for the recognition, but said it should go to his partner, who runs faster and catches all the criminals. That's not hard to believe, since his partner is a black and white German shepherd. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. Good things come to those who wait. That was the coaching philosophies of both Sonny Smith and Dale Brown Wednesday night. The coaches engaged in a strategy session concerning defenses. Auburn used a zone almost exclusively, and it was effective. LSU could not get inside penetration, was forced to take the low percentage outside shot, and only hit a third of its attempts from the field. That was right in tune with Sonny Smith's game plan, but the offense did not hold up its half of the bargain. For while LSU hit only 33%, Auburn did little better, hitting 41%. With six minutes remaining in the game, LSU held a 42-40 lead. That's when the waiting started. LSU tried to force Auburn into a man-to-man -man defense, but Sonny Smith wasn't biting. He feared a mismatch, so both teams waited. 
LSU held the ball for four solid minutes without taking a shot. Auburn appeared to be the victor when LSU turned the ball over with 2.45 remaining. Then it was Auburn's turn to stall. The Tigers held the ball for more than a minute until Frank Poindexter got loose for an eight-foot jumper, but it hit the rim. LSU controlled the ball and once again used the four-corner offense. With time running down, Auburn chose to foul Ethan Martin. The LSU junior calmly drilled home six free throws in the final 42 seconds, and that was the ball game. LSU defeats Auburn 50-44. to Fred Albers, WSFA TV Sports. A St. Clair County Commission spokesman says he isn't surprised at Varner's order forbidding the commission and others from interfering in the state prison construction plans. Billy Church, who represents three of the county commissioners, says Judge Varner indicated his feelings when the January 24th hearing ended. Church says, if you're asking me if I'm surprised, the answer is no. Church says he hasn't had a chance to talk about the ruling with Commission Chairman James McClendon, but he adds the chance of an appeal isn't too likely. Judge Varner ordered the commissioners to end condemnation procedures on the property. Church says unless there's an appeal, the commissioners will have no choice but to comply. A group, Citizens for a Better St. Clair County, also has a suit pending in federal court in Birmingham, but the group's attorney, Bill Baxley, hasn't been available to comment on whether he'll press on with his suit in light of the Varner order. Governor James's legal advisor, Mike Waters, says they're now working quickly to try and acquire the land from Kimberly Clark. Waters says the order will make it easier for Governor James to try and fulfill his promise to federal court to try and build three new prisons. Waters says a prison could soon be considered for the Tennessee Valley area, and within two or three years, a third prison could be considered for either the Montgomery or Birmingham areas. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. The suit was filed in Montgomery County Circuit Court on Wednesday by former Attorney General Bill Baxley. Baxley was making good a threat to sue Bronner if he didn't apologize for ordering an investigation of Troy State University. In the suit, filed on behalf of McDowell Lee, Secretary of the Alabama Senate, Baxley charges Bronner with using his office for personal gain. He alleges Bronner used retirement funds to pay personal attorney's fees in a previous suit, challenging Bronner's dual role with the retirement system and as finance director. Bronner says there's nothing wrong with the retirement system picking up the tab for the attorneys. He also says he didn't take any gifts during a national retirement convention at Gulf Shores in 1975, as the suit alleges. Another charge is that Bronner made personal investments while handling investments for the retirement system. Since I've had the job, and even before I've had the job, I have not ever bought a stock or bond personally for myself or for any member of my family. Uh, probably what I really need is to get Mr. Baxley's friends in uh, Las Vegas or probably Mr. Rousseau in uh, New Orleans to help me out in my financial dealings. Lee's suit does not mention the investigation of Troy State allegedly ordered by Bronner. Lee serves as the president pro tem of that body, even though his term expired in October of last year. So far, the James administration has not indicated when or if Lee will be reappointed. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News at the Capitol. No one said anything about the Department of Health in the state of Alabama. Then I quote, this resolution is a very good beginning. It is a Who's that walking around here?
like baby patter. Baby elephant patter, that's what I calls it. Say, up in Harlem, at a table for two, there were four of us, me, your big Pete, and you. From your ankle up, I'll say you sure are sweet. From that down, there's just too much feet. Yes, your feet's too big. Don't want you cause your feet's too big. Can't use you cause your feet's too big. I really hate you cause your feet's too big. Yeah. I do that. Where'd you get them? Your girl, she likes you, she thinks you're nice. Got what it takes to be in paradise. She said she likes your face, she likes your rig. Man, oh man, them things are too big. Oh, your feet's too big. Don't want you cause your feet's too big. Mad at you cause your feet's too big. I hate you cause your feet's too big. Shift, shift, shift. All your pedal extremities are colossal. To me, you look just like a fossil. Got me walking, talking, and sparking. Cause your feet too big, yeah. Come on and walk that thing. Oh, I never heard of such walking. Mercy. Your, your pedal extremities really are obnoxious. One never knows, do one? The problem with going to the doctor is getting shots. It starts out when you're a child with doctors and nurses poking and stabbing at you with needles. And they all hurt, even the good ones. But wouldn't it be nice if somebody could, say, make a Band-Aid with medicine on it that you could just put on your arm instead of getting a shot? Someone is working on it. Auburn University pharmacy professor Albert Belmonte has been trying to do just that for the last five years. We have been tied up for the past several years in very fundamental work, working with ointment bases, trying to optimize drug release from ointment bases because we know that the drug, the drug is released from various ointment bases at various rates and it depends very much on what is in the, the vehicle, in the drug ointment base itself. So we've been attempting to op optimize some of these uh, variables, trying to control them and come up with an optimum ointment base for several different drugs. The potential is there to therefore uh, offer a unique device for driving into the skin drugs which heretofore had not been able to be administered through the skin and in fact has the potential I feel and hopefully in my lifetime will do away with some of the injectables that we have today. Uh, specifically we've been working with several drugs that are very commonly encountered and in fact one, uh, one of my graduate students just finished uh, did a very nice study with insulin but the prospect of diabetics using Band-Aids impregnated with insulin is still a long way off. Lots of testing must first be done before the best ointment base is found, one that drives the drug through the skin without harmful side effects. Is this going to be something down the line years from now that people can actually use? I certainly hope so. It's something that uh, when we started out on this basic experimental work five years ago, we took some very fundamental ointment bases. We're talking about uh, petrolatum, Vaseline, and some other ointment bases that were around. The uh, results we got then uh, show that there was an effect, and we just hope to keep improving on our ointment bases such that, yeah, extrapolated into the future, I, I, can, I hope in my lifetime that uh, we can start vaccinating and indeed uh, providing drug therapy through the skin as opposed to the more invasive methods, mainly injectables such as subcutaneous and intramuscular injections. So, it's one of the areas that we certainly have as an objective, an ultimate objective in the project, 
we are still way back in the fundamental stages, certainly, just trying to formulate. But uh, I can't help but be optimistic about the future. Belmonte says it's all maybe five years away in terms of a marketable product. But it could mean a generation of kids that get their measles and polio and tetanus vaccinations from a Band-Aid instead of a needle. This is Carl Velker on the Auburn campus. It was a noisy, jam-packed Auburn Montgomery Physical Education Complex this evening, and the Hornet cheers grew louder as Alabama State hit six of its first seven shots to pull in front. AUM never caught up the entire evening. The Hornets dominated most of the first half, but AUM's Lonnie Nixon hit 10 straight points in the closing minutes to make the score 44 to 37 at intermission. However, the second half was all Alabama State. The Hornets outshot and out-rebounded AUM, building a lead as large as 20 points. The real difference in the ballgame was free throw shooting. Auburn Montgomery shot less than 50% from the line, missing many bonus opportunities. The Hornet followers were at their boisterous best as the Hornets coasted to an easy win. Grego seemed to put some icing on the cake with this bit of showmanship in the closing moments. The number one ranked Alabama State Hornets defeat Auburn Montgomery 82-73. to Fred Albers, WSFA TV Sports. The strikers say they walked out because of racial discrimination. They charge that Charles Browder, one of the owners, maintains separate eating and restroom facilities for blacks. That Browder has two Christmas parties, one for the white workers and another for the 52 black employees. They say whites here have their hospitalization insurance paid for by the company. Blacks, if they want health insurance, have to pay for their own. At least 20 of the striking employees told me they are not paid for all hours worked at the plant. Sometimes be short hours. Do you know why? No. Do you, why, why do you think you're short an hour? Because I keep up with my time and I know how much time I make. When I'm but short. you end up being short. Why? Yeah. What, what happens to your time? Do you have any idea? No, I don't. Somebody's got to be getting it. <laughs> yeah. Who's getting it? But it's got to be them, the company. Several Browner workers complained of chemical burns from machines and logs inside the plant. One woman says she has eye damage, but she says Browner officials didn't think her injury was important. Uh, this stuff had broke my eyes out. He told me, he gave me some kind of lotion. He said, uh, if you go to the doctor, say, say, this is probably what he's going to put on it. Say, you take some of this and put on it. And so, and then when I put it on my eyes, it, 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 it's worse because it run down in my eyes when I put it on there. It's something like water, it's not a lotion. He like, wouldn't let you, know. you go to the doctor? No, he wouldn't. Charles Browder, one of the owners, didn't want to comment on the allegation by the striking workers. WSFA TV News has learned of several investigations into the allegations of mistreatment of employees here at Browder Veneer. One investigation is being launched by the Labor Department, the Rage and Ira Division. Several civil rights lawsuits are being planned. Already, some of the employees on strike out here at Browder Veneer have given testimony to lawyers and to the Labor Department officials. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News reporting. January's increase almost doubled the nine-tenths of one percent rise in December. The most dramatic increase occurred in gasoline prices, which climbed a whopping five and seven-tenths percent. That's two and a half percent more than December prices. Home heating oil rose 2% after a one-tenth of 1% 1 increase in December. Even with the overall increase, food prices dropped eight-tenths of 1%. The Labor Department attributes the decline to the price of beef, veal, pork, eggs, and fresh fruits. But the price of dairy and bakery products rose as well as the price of fish, refined sugar in tiny packets, and milled rice. Even though there's been a drop in auto sales, the wholesale price of cars rose 2% last month, as compared to a six-tenths of 1% in December. The price of consumer durables ready for retail, items like furniture, appliances, luggage, and manufactured goods, increased 3.2%. Since wholesale prices rose overall one and six tenths percent in January, consumers can expect to see the effects of the increase in higher retail prices this month and possibly in the months to come. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News.
we pay you. We do all we can to see that you've got everything that we need. Wendell E. Kirkley, our department, as are the chief officers. That does. Last year, the eight staff recommended a plan to cut duplication among the public universities in Montgomery. The main part of the plan would have combined AUM, ASU, and Troy under one super board of trustees. At public hearings, the commission soon learned that there was opposition, and lots of it. Now the commission staff has a new plan, a plan AIC executive director John Porter says is less complicated and hopefully more acceptable. Of course, our statement from the beginning has been that voluntary cooperation would not work. We developed from that uh, series of discussions the idea of creating an authority through a legally binding agreement between two governing boards, which would meet the conditions and concerns of the commission, thereby providing means to solve the problem uh, of duplication of existing programs. According Once to Porter, the new plan would not need secured, approval from the legislature would and wouldn't cost as much. The new AIG staff proposal has only been in the hands of officials at ASU and AUM for a short time. Porter says so far they've had a little reaction from the schools, but he says public hearings on the new plan will be scheduled. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News. The lowest bids on three sections of the new Dauphin Island Bridge totaled more than $32 million. That's $4 million more than available federal funds will cover. The apparent low bid of $32 million submitted by Brown and Root of Houston, Texas, was $15.8 million less than the next closest bid. Highway Department Chief Engineer Bob Espy says the bids will undergo further examination before a contract will be let. He says additional funds may be required to build the bridge. Presuming that the, the bids were good, then uh, we would explore any source that we thought we could find. Is there any way that the state would have to put in this $4 million or local funds? Well, that would be a possibility uh, that would have to be considered, yes. Highway officials have said previously those funds may not be available. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. Yes, that are here. Public Safety Director Colonel Jerry Shoemaker says TAP, the Truck Accident Prevention Program, will focus its enforcement efforts on violations of traffic laws involving large trucks and buses. TAP's goal is to reduce truck-related accidents on Alabama's highways by 20 percent. To help reach that goal, the program will use unmarked cars. The owners of trucks will also be notified whenever one of their drivers is cited for a traffic offense. Even though the Truck Accident Prevention Program will place increased emphasis on enforcing truck-related laws, Colonel Shoemaker says the program won't overlook enforcing the same highway laws, such as a speed limit on automobile drivers. And to show just how serious it is, the Department of Public Safety plans to implement its new program Monday morning. I'm Sydney Kohara, WSFA TV News. Morgan is optimistic about the series of meetings in Washington designed to resolve the problems over the housing of some low-income families on the abandoned air base. Inflaming the problem are two lawsuits. One suit filed by the city of Selma seeks full control over the former base, and the second suit filed by the Legal Services Corporation of Selma calls for guaranteed low-income housing. Morgan says he hopes all three problems can be settled by the talks. We feel that uh, what the, the proposals that we made and those which the government's agreed to, to try to work with us on uh, would resolve the, the lawsuit trap. Morgan says a written version of the agreements reached this week should be in Selma for review within 10 days. Federal programs to rehabilitate and finance the housing units are still being looked into. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. Lieutenant Colonel Khaled bin Sultan bin Abdulaziz says Saudi Arabia and the U.S. must be united in order to overcome the crises in the Middle East. Prince Khaled says the Saudis are worried about Soviet encroachment in the Middle East, but that's not their only concern. Most important, and what most people does not realize, is that our concern 
in this matter is equal to our concern to the Palestinian problem. Prince Khalid, who's attending Air War College at Maxwell, says that as a world superpower, the U.S. can't afford to overlook smaller countries. And he says if the Palestinian issue is not settled, most Arab countries will start drifting away from the West in the 1980s. Lisa Nielsen, WSFA TV News. It was hard to tell who wanted the victory more. The teams on the court are the fans in the bleachers. Auburn, Montgomery, and Alabama State fans filled the Senator's physical education complex to capacity. It was the Hornet fans who had the most to cheer about. Alabama State hit six of its first seven shots to establish the early lead. AUM had to play catch up the rest of the night. Lonnie Nixon hit 10 straight points at the close of the first half to draw the Senators within seven points. But Alabama State came out firing in the second period. The Hornets controlled the boards and established leads as large as 20 points. AUM caused most of its own problems, especially at the free throw line. The Senators made 13 of 30 attempts and missed the front end of five straight bonus opportunities. That performance, combined with some poor field goal shooting, turned into a six-minute scoreless stretch and sealed the game's outcome. AUM was able to narrow the final margin to nine points, but it was clearly Alabama State's night to strut its stuff. Alabama State defeats Auburn Montgomery 82-73. Fred Albers, WSFA TV Sports. Uh, Don Merrick is supposed to be coming up, and he's in good shape. He plays second one year at the NCAA. Uh, Ray Robinson, the boy that missed out on the Olympics, made the team and uh, missed by uh, 15 minutes of making the trial heats. He's supposed to be in the race. And Emmett King is in it. Now, Emmett King is this young sprinter from Jeff State uh, who has been running well up in the north or one up in uh, Maple Leaf games. And this can be a real tight field. Uh, Coach, this year there's an opportunity for a sub four minute mile. Dick Berkeley is a world class uh, runner. Tell us about Dick Berkeley and his chance of running perhaps a sub four minute mile on our track. Well, Dick, as some people may know, made the American Olympic team in the 5,000 meters. And then the following year, uh, he started running the mile pretty regularly. He wanted to see what he can do. And lo and behold, the first meet he ran in was up in. College Park, Maryland, and ran 354.5 for a new American record. Uh, since then, he's moved down to Atlanta, and he's been training pretty well, and uh, might be able to do it, though the competition may not be that stiff. There's a couple of boys from uh, Clemson who have run 405, and so I don't know anybody else in the race that may push him. But the thing about it is that people don't realize that this track in Montgomery may be about the fastest track in the country outside of one at the Astrodome because it is a 10-lap track and it is a, a wide track so you can pass easily. Uh, it's been resurfaced, it's fast, and so uh, it depends on what kind of shape Dick's in. He does run from the front, so the competition doesn't mean a whole lot because he may go right after it and get close to that four-minute mile. Eastern Airlines officials in Atlanta and here in Montgomery confirmed today plans to discontinue service to Danley Field as of June 1st. Official word of the planned flight changes is expected to be announced by a company representative this Thursday. According to Eastern's regional manager of public relations, Carolyn Wills, Montgomery flights to and from Atlanta will be discontinued so the company can reallocate its equipment and personnel to more profitable areas. When asked if the airline had problems filling its Montgomery flights, the answer was no. However, Wills did note deregulation of air routes and higher jet fuel costs were considered in the decision. The chairman of the Montgomery Airport Authority, Don Reynolds, says an eastern pullout will have a financial effect on Danley Field. In particular, a revenue loss of between seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollars a year. Reynolds adds the airport can survive and that if Eastern leaves Montgomery, another air carrier will be sought to fill the routes or present airlines may be asked to add more flights. Montgomery Mayor Emery Falmer is upset, saying he's never been contacted by Eastern about their plan. He says the Alabama congressional delegation will be contacted because the Atlanta-Montgomery route is important. Certainly people have been using Eastern Airlines and I'm 
am told that it's not lack of bookings that uh, has caused them to want to terminate this service. Uh, the transportation to and from Atlanta is essential to uh, Montgomery uh, persons who are doing business. It's essential to Maxwell Air Force Base and the uh, Air University. They Montgomery's Eastern employees won't be losing their jobs. They've been offered transfers, all expenses paid. Company officials say all that's left is federal approval by the Civil Aeronautics Board. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News at Danley Field. Watkins says civil rights issues are as relevant today, if not more so, than during the Brown versus the Board of Education case in 1959. As an example, he noted the controversy surrounding the federal judgeship confirmations of U.W. Clement and Fred Gray. The American Bar Association says both men aren't qualified for the positions. Watkins says this statement isn't true. He says it's a final attempt by the American Bar Association to block black access to federal judgeships. Watkins says if any of the allegations were true, both men would have been disciplined or disbarred by now. Speaking directly to those students present, Watkins said the real test and final grade comes after graduation when they have to face the world. He says jobs for blacks are harder to find since the Bakke ruling and challenged them to fight for their position in life. And you got to be twice as smart, think twice as fast, figure out stuff quicker than anybody else, and they're already moved on it before they can get started. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. Because I was a student at law school up at, up at, uh... The blaze broke out around 1045 at the IGA store on South Court Street. Within minutes after receiving the call, Montgomery firefighters were on the scene. According to Sergeant D.R. Michael, the fire was contained to a motor room in the back of the building. He says that area housed a central heating unit and compressors for the store's freezers. Eight employees in the store at the time of the fire were not injured. It took firefighters close to 15 minutes to get the blaze under control, but not before flames had spread from the motor room to the northeast corner of the store. Sergeant Michael says damage to the room itself was extensive, while the store and its contents suffered light smoke and heat damage. Initially, two pumpers, a ladder and a district chief, were called to the scene. Later, another ladder and a snorkel truck arrived. Mayor Emery Falmer was on the scene and praised fire officials for preventing a more serious fire. Store owner Norman Olive says he has no idea how the fire began other than to say the store's heater was on. Fire officials plan to continue their investigation into the cause of the blaze. Paul Roth, WSFA TV News. Forty-five high school students representing nine regional areas participated in the competition. Each read a paper in one of five categories, humanities, biology, math, engineering, and physical science. A winner was chosen from each category, including Daryl Johnson of Montgomery. All the winners will go to the national competition in South Carolina. Then the judges listened as the top papers were read again, this time to choose an overall winner who will submit a paper in the national competition. William Murray from Birmingham was chosen the overall winner. The judges also picked Gerald McGlamory from Florence as a recipient of the Bell Labs Tour Award, sponsored by the Bell Telephone Company. Cassandra Taylor, WSFA TV News. Eastern Airlines will formally notify the Civil Aeronautics Board tomorrow of its plans to discontinue its Montgomery service. Prior to our reporting of the decision, Eastern officials had planned to make a public announcement Thursday. Mayor Emery Fulmer says the Eastern flights between Montgomery and Atlanta are important, and he plans to do all he can to keep them, including asking assistance from the state's congressional delegation. Senator Howell Heflin told me that he will explore every possible avenue of assistance for Montgomery. A spokesman for Senator Donald Stewart says his office is checking into the situation and trying to talk with Eastern officials. And a spokesman for Congressman Bill Dickinson says they are shocked by Eastern's decision and hopes the airline will reconsider. The Civil Aeronautics Board requires that an airline give 60 days written notice of its intentions to discontinue flight service. If it's shown that the plan would not adversely affect the area, the plan is usually approved. It's not known if Montgomery's two other airlines, Delta and Republic, plan to add extra flights if Eastern leaves Montgomery. Michael Jones, WSFA TV News at Danley Field.
Well, the first thing I would suggest is that they contact us and let us go over their building so that we can have a better knowledge of what the problem is. At that point, we would make a, a written estimate or a written recommendations to them of what to do. Uh, you can't very well take a building and give them a guideline and let them go at you. You've got to see the building, you've got another problems. For the past two weeks, faculty at the University of Alabama have been voting in a faculty senate-sponsored referendum. The referendum is being conducted by the various schools within the university. The secret ballot poses three options to the faculty. Number one, vacate the call for a new university administration. In other words, a vote of confidence for Dr. David Matthews. Number two, extend the trial period now in effect until the March meeting of the faculty senate. And three, express a continuing sense of no confidence in the present administration, but be willing to work with anyone for the improvement of the university. One of the largest schools, Arts and Sciences, was to complete its voting by Monday afternoon. Early tabulations from some of the other schools show the no confidence option with a majority of only one vote. About 700 faculty members are expected to vote in the referendum. After the vote is tallied, the Faculty Senate will once again express its confidence or no confidence in the administration of Dr. David Matthews. Whatever the outcome, university officials say they'll be willing to work with the faculty members for the improvement of the university. Dennis Latham, WSFA-TV News in Tuscaloosa. Berkeley, the totally bald former world record holder for the indoor mile, ran a disappointing 4 minutes 14 seconds in winning his heat of the qualifying mile run this afternoon. Berkeley told us afterward he ran like a rusty gate, and his chances of breaking 4 minutes are practically nil in tomorrow's finals. But I'll tell you this, he's worth the price of admission, and he likes the track. He says it's fast enough for a sub 4 minute mile, but he's just not far enough along in his comeback attempt to do it right now. Berkeley lives in Atlanta. He's battling back from an injury now in hopes of making the Olympic team this summer. The sprint trials are going on now. Finals at all events tomorrow here at Garrett Coliseum. The mile run final will be about 5 o'clock. This is Phil Snow reporting from Garrett Coliseum.
Eastern Flight 508, departing Danley Field, bound for Atlanta. This is one of three Eastern flights daily to Atlanta that will end June 1st when Eastern suspends its Montgomery route. That will leave Alabama's capital city with two airlines, Delta and Republic. Will there be enough air service to Montgomery without Eastern? Delta's Montgomery manager says while his airline is not planning to add more flights, it probably will use larger planes. But Gil Malik says even now they can handle more passengers. Right now we have over 550 seats available per day out of here, and we're only using uh, approximately 350 of them. So that leaves 200 empty seats a day uh, that we can accommodate that many more passengers. Malik says it's doubtful a commuter airline will set up service in Montgomery. Tomorrow morning at 11, Eastern Airlines officials will meet with Mayor Fulmer, members of the Montgomery Airport Authority, and the Chamber of Commerce. Immediately following the meeting, Eastern is expected to announce the suspension of its Montgomery service. Michael Jones, WSFA-TV News, Danley Field. This is the fashionable Columbus suburb of Winton, where most of the murders occurred. All of the victims were elderly, wealthy women. All were strangled with a stocking. Sargentson says while he was preparing his prison series, two death row inmates approached him with information about the strangler. They said they were telling him because, in their words, they had nothing to lose. They were going to die anyhow. Sargentson was told the suspect had bragged to other inmates about the Columbus killings. For the security of the informants, the name of the prison where Sargentson was approached is being withheld. Attempts to isolate the inmates have been unsuccessful due to limited prison space. Officials with the Columbus Police Department say they're a little reluctant to be optimistic about the reports. They say the information they have received will be treated the same as all information received in the past. A police spokesman, David Hopkins, did admit someone from his department had visited the prison, but he refused to elaborate. Dave Rickey, WSFA TV News. At times today, smoke rose above Huntsville in a 900-foot column as the complex burned. The fire was first reported about 4.30 this morning. It burned for more than 12 hours. Times during the day, there were minor explosions inside the building, and firemen quickly evacuated a 10-block area, fearing that larger explosions would follow. They didn't. The 750,000-square-foot complex was part of an area of downtown Huntsville that for years was the heart of the city's cotton industry. It was built around the turn of the century. The age of the Hick building will cause some real grief for some of its tenants. Because it was so old, there was no insurance included in the lease. Two tenants talked about their business with Huntsville's Channel 19. It's in the back rear of the building, uh, the northeast corner. And uh, we were back on that side a few minutes ago, and it looks like it's burning. But it hasn't reached mine yet, but I have no hopes of keeping anything. You work in the same place? Yeah, we work at, uh, for World Media Graphics, and we have a, a whole lot of graphic supplies in there and a whole lot of our own things stored in there. And Of course, there's no insurance on it because we didn't have any insurance of our own. And uh, in our lease, of course, it said that, you know, uh, Huntsville no Industrial Center, you know, has no, you know, fire or theft damage. Uh, One of the reasons for the massive evacuation and the closing of two Huntsville schools, Lehigh School and Lincoln Middle School, was chemicals stored inside the building. Police Chief Sal Vazzini says propane, chlorine, and 700 gallons of charcoal lighter fluid were inside the burning Hick building. But miraculously, the feared big blasts never came, and no serious injuries have been reported. All told, there were about 60 businesses in the complex, and the damage is going to run well into the millions. Skip Haley, WSFA TV News. Alicia McLeod and nearly a dozen other Opelika residents are very upset over the apparent strychnine poisoning of house pets over the last several years. Ms. McLeod says many pets just mysteriously disappear and later are found dead. Four years ago, these pictures were taken of some dead animals. Only some of a dozen or so found dead that day due to apparent poisoning. Opelika Mayor D.B. Jones told me in an interview this morning he speculated some farmers could have been putting out poisonous hot dogs to ward off what he called packs of dogs who kill calves and cause other damage. Ms. McLeod agrees with the hypothesis. 
In bringing their arguments to City Hall, the citizens group found two problems. First, Alabama state law doesn't prohibit someone from putting poison out on their property under certain conditions. And second, the city of Opelika has no city ordinance protecting against these type animal poisonings. We're concerned that our children are going to be poisoned. Uh, in fact, we're, uh, I feel relatively lucky so far that they haven't already been. And Ms. McLeod's group presented the commissioners with a petition this afternoon that asked for an ordinance prohibiting any type of animal poisonings within city limits. But Commissioner Stanley Drake thinks such an ordinance is premature for the problem. It's my hope that once both sides, if we can call them sides, understand the problems and the concerns of the other, that some amiable reconciliation of this matter can be had. Ms. McLeod accuses the commission of looking lightly on what she calls a potentially dangerous situation. Ms. McLeod says if her group fails with the Opelika City Commission, then they'll try for changes in the state law governing the use of poisons. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA-TV News, Opelika.